Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Now we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 11th of September 2018 and the news that would be covered today is given on the screen and the timestamp for the same is given in the description and the comment section given below. Now apart from this, there is an important initiative for which we would like your participation. Now we are conducting a student satisfaction survey regarding our DNS learning videos. And you can provide your feedback as it would help us to know better and deliver better. And you can click on the survey link from the description section given below. And so now with this, let us move on to the first article for today. Now we have taken this article from page 3. Now what this article talks about is that the Odisha government has decided to form digital dispensaries in Ganjam district. Now what we need to understand from this article is about digital dispensaries. And we'll try to understand about digital dispensaries from the perspective of your mains examination. First in GS paper 2, within the subsection issues relating to development and management of social sector services relating to health. And after that we'll try to understand from the perspective of GS paper 3, within the subsection science and technology, development and their applications and effects in everyday life. So now let us understand about digital dispensaries. Now these digital dispensaries would be established in remote and inaccessible areas in the state of Odisha. Wherein these digital dispensaries would be established in those areas which have no primary healthcare centers within a 5 km radius. And in the initial phase, these digital dispensaries are being established in the Ganjam district of Orisha. Wherein prior to this, it has already been established in two other districts in the state of Orisha. Now let us understand the various services that are going to be provided in these digital dispensaries. Now the first service that would be provided is online video consultations with doctors. Secondly, the digital dispensaries would also serve as a basic pathology lab. The third service it would provide is that it would become a dispensing center for generic medicines. And the fourth and the last main service that would be provided by these digital dispensaries is that the pharmacist would serve as an interlink between the doctor and the patient when the pharmacist would act as an agent for the exchange of reports from the patient to the doctor and for the exchange in medicines that have been prescribed by the doctor to the patient. So now hopefully up till here you've understood that the digital dispensaries are going to be established in remote and inaccessible areas which have no form of primary healthcare centers within a 5 km radius. Wherein in the initial phase, these digital dispensaries are being established in the Ganjam district of Orisha, wherein these digital dispensaries have also been established in two other districts. Now there are four main services that are going to be provided at these digital dispensaries wherein the first service would be of online video consultations with the doctors. Secondly, these digital dispensaries would serve as a basic pathology testing lab. Thirdly, they would also serve as a dispensing center for generic medicines. And lastly, the pharmacists at these digital dispensaries would also serve as an interlink between the doctor and the patient wherein they would provide the doctor with the medical reports of the patients and in similar terms, they would provide the patients with the prescribed medicines by the doctor. So now hopefully you've understood the basic features of the digital dispensaries, wherein you would be able to use this initiative as an example while answering a question in the mains examination on issues related to development and management of the health sector. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 13. Now what we need to understand from this article is about the index called Democles. Now this index is given out by a Japanese banking firm called Namura. Now the purpose of this index is that it is an early warning system that assesses the risk of exchange rate prices and this index assesses the risk of exchange rate prices for 30 emerging market economies which includes countries like India, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Argentina, Pakistan, Turkey, Ukraine among others. Now this index uses 8 parameters and these parameters are based on indicators such as foreign exchange reserves, import cover, external debt, fiscal and current deficit, interest rates, among other various indicators. Wherein this index provides a score, wherein if the score is more than 150 for a country, it signals that there is an imminent exchange rate crisis within that country. And if the score is more than 100 in a country, it signals that the country is vulnerable to a crisis in the next one year where India's score in this index is 25. So now hopefully you've understood the basic features of the Democles index, wherein it is given by a Japanese banking firm called Nemura. And the purpose of this index is that it is an early warning system 
that assesses the risk of exchange rate crisis for the 30 most emerging market economies, wherein it includes countries like Argentina, South Africa, Pakistan, Egypt, India, Turkey, among others. And this index uses eight parameters which are based on several indicators such as foreign exchange reserves, import cover, external debt, fiscal and current deficit, interest rate, among other various indicators of a particular country. Wherein if a country scores more than 150 on this index, it signals that there is an imminent exchange rate crisis in within that country. And if the score is more than 100, then that country is vulnerable to a crisis of exchange rate within the next 12 months. So now it is important for you to remember the features of the Democles scale wherein previous equations have been asked in your prelims examination as to which organization prepares which index. Where if you take a look at the prelims paper of 2018, a question was asked as to who prepares the rule of law index, wherein the correct answer to this question is the World Justice Project. Wherein if you take an example of the prelims examination paper of 2017, a question was asked as to who prepares the Global Gender Gap Index report, wherein the correct answer to this question is a World Economic Forum. And if in similar terms, if you take an example of the prelims examination paper of 2016, it had asked as to what are the indicators of the Global Hunger Index report. And the correct answer to this question is C, 1, 2, and 3. Similarly, it had asked as to who prepares the ease of doing business index, when the correct answer to this question is C, World Bank. And moreover, the 2016 paper had also asked as to who prepares the Global Financial Stability report, when the correct answer to this question is B, International Monetary Fund or IMF. And it is within this context as to who prepares the Democles Index and what are the indicators of this index becomes relevant for your 2019 prelims examination. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 18. Now what this article talks about is that the United Nations and the World Meteorological Organization have said that there is a 70% chance of an El Nino effect developing this year. Now what we'll try to understand from this article is what is the El Nino effect and we'll try to understand this with the help of the NCRT book. Now we have taken this chapter 4 from the class 9th NCRT book of social studies. Now what generally happens is that a cold current passes through the Peruvian coast but during the El Nino phenomena a warm ocean current flows past the Peruvian coast and this phenomena happens every 2 to 5 years. So now if you take a look at this map and in particular South America this region is known as the Peruvian coast and in normal years you can see it consists of what is called a cold water current. However, what happens in an El Nino year is that this cold water current is replaced by a warm water current. So now hopefully you've gotten the first aspect of the El Nino effect wherein the cold water current is replaced by a hot water current in the Peruvian coast. And therefore as this book continues, El Nino is the development of a warm ocean current along the coast of Peru. And this development of a warm ocean current temporarily replaces the cold Peruvian current, wherein the presence of the El Nino effect leads to an increase in the sea surface temperatures and the weakening of the trade winds in the region. So now hopefully you've also understood the second aspect of the El Nino effect. So now you have understood the basic aspects of the El Nino effect that has been given in your class 9th NCRT book. Now we have taken chapter 4 from the class 11th NCRT geography book which is titled India's Physical Environment. Wherein according to this book, El Nino is a complex weather system that appears once every 3 to 7 years. And the El Nino phenomenon brings droughts, floods and other weather extremes to different parts of the world. Now according to this book, the El Nino effect involves both oceanic and atmospheric phenomena. Wherein what we have just learned from the class 9th book is that there is an appearance of a warm current off the coast of Peru which replaces the cold current system that generally exists along the coast of Peru. Wherein during an El Nino year, the warm current is basically an extension of the warm equatorial current. Wherein if you take a look at this image, in a normal year, you already know that there is a cold ocean current on the Peruvian coast. But what happens during an El Nino year is the warm equatorial current moves into the Peruvian coast. So therefore, if you consider an equatorial warm current during a normal year, it is basically an extension during an El Nino year but on the Peruvian coast and therefore hopefully you understand when the book says that the El Nino is basically an extension of the warm equatorial current which is extended towards the Peruvian coast which it generally doesn't do during a normal year. And this warm equatorial current 
increases the temperature of the water on the Peruvian coast by roughly 10 degrees Celsius. So now hopefully up till you have also understood the third aspect of the El Nino effect wherein it is merely an extension of the warm equatorial current whereby it increases the temperature of water on the Peruvian coast by roughly around 10 degrees Celsius. So now apart from this what is relevant for you to understand for your civil service examination is the effect of the El Nino phenomena wherein the first effect of the El Nino phenomena is that it distorts the equatorial atmospheric circulation wherein what happens is the flow of the warm equatorial current creates a low pressure on the South American or the Peruvian coast while the shifting of the warm equatorial current to the Peruvian coast causes a high pressure zone to develop on the other side and therefore leads to the creation of dry conditions in the Indo-Pacific region while leads to the creation of wet conditions on the Peruvian coast. And this is how El Nino phenomena affects the atmospheric circulation. The second effect of the El Nino phenomena is that it creates irregularities in the evaporation of sea water. Now again if you take a look at this image, during a normal year, the Peruvian coast is cons generally consists of a cold water current while the coast of Australia in a normal year would generally consist of a warm ocean current and thereby this leads to high evaporation during a normal year along the coast of Australia. However, what happens in an El Nino year is that the warm ocean current flows through the Peruvian coast and this causes the reversal in the evaporation of sea water during an El Nino year. So now hopefully you have also understood as to how the El Nino phenomenon leads to irregularities in the evaporation of sea water. And the third and the final effect given in the class 11th NCRT book of the El Nino phenomena is that there is a reduction in the amount of planktons which further reduces the number of fish in the sea. So now if you take a look at this image, in a normal year, there is an upwelling of cold ocean water along the Peruvian coast wherein during a normal year, the cold ocean water moves upwards to replace the warm ocean water and this upwelling creates a layer of mutant rich water which leads to high concentration of plankton. However what happens during an El Nino event is that there is weak upwelling and therefore a layer of nutrient rich water is not formed and thereby it leads to low plankton concentration and because planktons are one of the organisms on which fish feed upon it leads to a decrease in the total number of fish along the Peruvian coast. And therefore, in, during an El Nino year, because there is weak upwelling, it leads to a reduction in the layer of nutrient-rich water, thereby reducing the number of planktons, wherein plankton is an organism on which fish feed upon. And because of the decrease in plankton population along the Peruvian coast, it leads to a decrease in the population of fish along the Peruvian coast in an El Nino year. So now hopefully you also understood the three main effects of the El Nino phenomena given in the class 11th NCRT book. Now apart from this, there are two other aspects of the El Nino effect that you should be aware of. First, the effect of the El Nino system on the Indian monsoon and second, the relation between El Nino and Southern oscillations. However, we won't be going into the depth of both of these aspects. So what you can do is read the given NCRT chapters in this section to understand the effect of El Nino and on the Indian monsoon and the relation between El Nino and Southern oscillations. And apart from this, what I'll do is provide you a link to a YouTube video which provides a graphic explanation as to what is the El Nino effect wherein with the explanation given in this section from the NCRT books and the graphic explanation given in this video you would be able to understand completely as to what is the El Nino effect. Now with regards to questions for practice we have taken the first objective type question with both the statements appearing in the prelims examination of 2011 while the second subjective question has been taken from the mains examination in the year 2014. And you can try to answer both of these questions with the help of the explanation given in this section in addition with the explanation given in the NCRT books. And apart from this you can leave the correct answer of the objective question in the comment section given below. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 1. Now what this article talks about is that the Delhi government has launched what is called a doorstep delivery of government services. Now under this program, residents of Delhi can now apply for roughly 40 government services or 40 government documents which will then be delivered at their home and for the services they would be charged rupees 50. Now under the scheme, the residents of Delhi can have 40 documents such as driving licenses, marriage certificates, ration card, birth certificate, caste certificate, water connection among other 40 documents which they can have delivered at their home wherein a Delhi resident can apply to fix an appointment with a mobile sahag. 
and this mobile sahayak will visit the applicant's home and help with the filling of forms, the payment of fees and the collection of documents. And this mobile sahayak would then submit the documents which he has collected from the applicant at the concerned government office. And it is after this that the Delhi government office in which the documents have been submitted shall then verify and process these documents and thereby then post the relevant service documents such as the driving license or the marriage certificate or the ration card at the postal address of the applicant. And it is through this process a resident of Delhi can apply for a doorstep delivery of services. So now hopefully you have understood the basic features of the service launched by the Delhi government of doorstep delivery of services. So now let us understand the various benefits of this initiative. Now the first benefit of this service is that it would save a lot of time for citizens as they do not have to go to government offices to get these important documents. The second benefit of this scheme is that it would reduce the crowds in Delhi government offices. The third benefit of this scheme is that it would decrease the interaction between touts that are outside government offices and between the citizens that come to government offices to avail government services. I mean, what used to happen earlier is that when citizens used to visit government offices to avail services such as forming a Russian card, they would be bombarded by touts who would then take a commission to form their Russian cards. However, now with the doorstep delivery of services, it has reduced the interaction between the touts that wander outside the government offices and the citizens who visit the government offices for services. The fourth benefit of this scheme is that it would lead to digital accountability. Wherein under this initiative of the Delhi government of doorstep delivery of services, aspects such as the payment of fees, the verification of documents, the delivery of services through post will all be done through digital platform and thereby increase the digital accountability of government employees. The fifth benefit of this scheme is that it would reduce corruption due to a decrease in public dealing of government employees. Wherein because of doorstep delivery of services, there is a decrease in the direct public interaction or public dealing of government employees and therefore it reduces the chances of asking for a bribe and other forms of corruption. And the sixth and the last main benefit of this scheme would be that it would reduce red tapeism, meaning that it would reduce the bureaucratic hurdles that a citizen of Delhi has to go through in availing a government service. So now hopefully you've understood the six main benefits of the doorstep delivery of services launched by the Delhi government. Now let us understand as to where it would be placed within your UPSC examination syllabus. Within first, it would be placed in GS Paper 2 within the section Governance. Within the subsection, Government Policies and Interventions for Development in Various Sectors. And in similar terms, it would also be placed in important aspects of governance. And apart from this, the Delhi Government Initiative would also be placed in GS Paper 4 within the section Ethics and Integrity and within the subsection Quality of Service Delivery. Now we have taken this article from page 2. Now this article contains a small information that you need to remember for your prelims examination as to the stone pelting festival called Goth Mar. Wherein the first aspect that you need to remember is the location of this festival. Now the location of this annual Goth Mar festival is Savargaon and Pandurna in the Chindwara district of Madhya Pradesh. Wherein this festival is hosted across the Jam River. And apart from this, the purpose of this Goth Mar festival is to pay homage to a local folklore, meaning that this festival is held while remembering our local story. So now hopefully you understood the basic features of the Kothmar festival from the perspective of your prelims examination. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 11. Now what this article talks about is the first military exercise under BIMSTEC, wherein this military exercise is going to be held in Pune. But what we need to understand from this article is why Nepal is being reluctant to participate in the first BIMSTEC military exercise. Now the first reason given by the government of Nepal is that Nepal doesn't intend to be a part of any military initiatives that are led by regional blocs. Wherein according to Nepal, it only participates in military initiatives on a bilateral level or under the purview of the United Nations. And according to the government of Nepal, it does not want to participate in military initiatives led by regional blocs such as BIMSTEC. The second reason for the reluctance of Nepal is that various political groups in Nepal claim is that a military exercise is beyond the purview of BIMSTEC. Wherein according to various political groups in Nepal, the current priority area of BIMSTEC which focuses on security, wherein the BIMSTEC priority area on security is counter-terrorism and transnational crime. And according to various political groups in Nepal, Military exercise does not form 
or fall within the purview of this agenda. The third reason for the reluctance of Nepal is that there is a civilian military conflict within Nepal. Wherein what had happened is the Nepalese army had initially agreed to participate in the BIMSTEC military exercise. But what happened afterwards is that the central government of Nepal refused to participate in the first BIMSTEC military exercise. And the fourth and the last reason given for the reluctance of Nepal is that the first BIMSTEC military exercise is an India-led initiative. And the reluctance of Nepal might be due to appeasement of China. So now hopefully you've understood the four main reasons given for the reluctance of Nepal to participate in the first BIMSTEC military exercise. Wherein the first reason given is that Nepal doesn't want to be part of the military initiative that is led by regional blocs. Wherein according to the government of Nepal, it only participates in bilateral military exercises and in military initiatives led by the United Nations. And it does not want to be part of any form of military initiatives that are led by regional blocs such as BIMSTEC. The second reason given is that military exercise is not within the purview of BIMSTEC's agenda. Wherein the BIMSTEC priority area on security is counter-terrorism and transnational crime. And according to various political groups in Nepal, military exercise does not fall within the purview of this. The third reason given is because of the civilian military conflict. Wherein the Nepalese army initially agreed to participate in the BIMSTEC military exercise but was later refused by the central government of Nepal. And the last reason given for Nepal's reluctance to participate in the military exercise is that it is an India-led initiative since counter-terrorism and transnational crime is an India-led priority area and this Nepalese reluctance might be to appease China. Now this explanation would be placed in GS Paper 2 within the section International Relations within the subsection India and its Neighbourhood Relations and secondly in regional groupings affecting India's interest. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now one of the aspects that we highlighted in an earlier DNS video is that when preparing for a prelims examination within the slavish context of geography of the world, wherein for questions such as which city or town is located in which country, which ethnic group belongs to which country, wherein you can prepare for these questions by highlighting the various cities or towns or ethnic groups which are highlighted in the headlines in the world page of the Hindu newspaper. So for today, there are two cities which have been highlighted in the headlines, first being Idlib and the second being Hama. And you need to remember that both of these cities are located in Syria from the perspective of your prelims examination. And this is an exercise that you should continue for each day as to find out which international city or town or ethnic group has been mentioned in the headlines of the world page in any newspaper that you follow such as the Hindu, the Indian Express or any other. And this would help you in preparing for the questions that are asked in the context of which city or town is located in which country within the 2019 prelims examination. And now with this we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now before moving on to the question for today, I would like to request you to please participate in the student survey that we are conducting to improving DNS. And the link for the survey is given in the description section given below. And now with this, let us move on to the question for today.